Hi, I'm going to run through processing of a few images I've got of M51. These images were taken under less than perfect conditions over a period of about five days. I've done nothing with the images other than to copy them into a folder that I've called Lights for Sorting. I know for a fact that in, within these images are some that are not suitable for being used within the stack itself and I really need to sort out which ones I want to use and which ones are best to use. Um, before we go any further we'll open up the screen transfer function window just so we can and we'll leave that hidden at the top down at the bottom of the screen so we can use it at any time. But that's a typical sub, um, probably one of the better ones. Um, you can see that it's a one-shot colour camera. These images are not debayed. Um, we have hot pixels and we have quite a lot of noise. Now, one of the easiest ways I've found of sorting images that are best to use is to use a fairly new script called Subframe Selector. And I've already added as target frames all all of the images that are in that folder, all 43 of them. Um, and I've put in my subframe scale of 1.21 arc seconds per pixel and a camera gain of about 0.5. It's a CCD, so the it's a 16-bit range. If this was a DSLR, you'd drop that to 14-bit. Um, the rest of it doesn't really make much difference. Um, but I've added in a, an expression at the moment, and I've typical expression I use for this, and I'm saying that I only want to approve subframes where the signal to noise ratio weight of them is greater than 0.7, and they have a full width half maximum of less than 3. So if we now click on measure, it takes a few seconds just to go through each frame, um, measure them for those various system parameters, and very shortly we will get a list of frames, and it will automatically select those that meet that criteria. We can also plot um, the variation in a number of variety, a variety of factors. Um, in here, what we've got signal to noise ratio of weight, and we can see that our our cutoff of 0.7 is quite it's quite harsh. Um, on the samples, but you know, I do I do want to try and only take the best of them. And in terms of full width half maximum, uh, we've taken a few more samples out. Now, if you look at the signal to noise ratio weight graph, anything with a cross in it is going to be rejected. Anything with a dot on it is going to be approved. Now, we could possibly knock that down to 0.65. We'll pull in a few more subframes. We will, we will in fact improve 28 of the 43, but for speed of subsequent processing, I'm going to leave that at 0.7, which gives me 21 subframes. Now, I just looked down the full width half maximum to see whether I've got any that are at sort of 3. Point one and we've got a couple here which have got quite nice signal to noise ratios um, and a full width half maximum of only just over one so let's let's just increase that to 3.1 and run again and we get now get 25 frames um, which is probably a better option now we're going to copy those frames from where we where we enter them to into a processing folder and we're going to add a postfix to the file name A for approved. So if we now output those subframes it'll copy those into our processing directory. It will take a few moments to do that. We can now dismiss that. Now, if we open one of our, have a look in that directory, we should see 
its sorting directory is unchanged, but our images, approved images, are sitting there in our processing directory. <coughs> there is one more thing I'm going to do before carrying on with processing, and that's go through a process called Blink. It's already got my last, so let's just clear, close all images, and open the ones from image files. And this Blink is a very good way of visually seeing what you're going to get. And it's worth, at the moment, let's put a screen transfer function based on the first image and applied that screen transfer, that stretch to all of them. If you click on the top one, it recalculates the stretch for each image. Now we're just going to cycle through those and just look for anything that's going to cause us problems. There's a bit of a satellite trail there. It's not through It's not through the main nebula itself, but I think I'm going to take that one out of the stack. You can see that, and that's probably the other one that goes with it. I'm going to take that out of the stack as well. And you can see that the, the quality of these, even though we've sorted them, is quite variable. That one I'm going to take out of the stack. A satellite trail right through the middle of the image is probably going to be difficult to get rid of. And I'm going to take that one out of the stack. Satellite trails and definitely that one out of the stack. So we're just going to move those into a folder called Rejected. Stacking should be able to get rid of satellite trails, but I find with one-shot colour cameras, it can actually, certainly very bright satellite trails like this can leave quite a nasty artefact behind after they've, even after they've been stacked with re fairly perfect rejection criteria. So we now have a set of subs that we can carry on processing with. Now we've sorted out which images we're going to process. The next step is to, and I do this rather the rather long way of doing each individual step one at a time. The first thing we want to do is carry out some image calibration. Again, it's remembered my last set of images, so we'll now add in the ones we put in for approval. We've got to put a master bias, which is a stack of 200 bias frames. I'm not going to use, in this instance, a dark frame. The Attic 460 one-shot color camera that I use for these images has got a very, very low dark current. And the experiments I've done suggest that actually using a, a dark to calibrate those frames adds more noise than it takes away anything else so I'm, I'm going to use n not use a, a dark frame um, it's something I'm doing more and more often these days particularly with one shot colour and DSLR images um, obtaining a master dark A is very time consuming but B uh, I really don't see much difference in, in using it in producing my master flat I've already calibrated each flat by subtracting a master bias so I won't, don't need to then subsequently calibrate my master bias before using it. That is all there is to calibration. If you just click on Apply Global, it will run through and calibrate all 20 frames. That takes a few moments. By all means, you know, if, you, if you believe that a dark is needed. Um, PixInsight has the ability to actually optimise that. 
other software calls dark scaling you do need in those instances a bias and you would then click on calibrate you calibrate the master dark click on opt optimize and it would then scale your dark to minimize the noise added by using a dark but in this instance I'm not even going to use a dark at all so we now should have in our directory of image files some with a C suffix and the C stands for calibrated so that helped helps keep things in order I do dump everything into the same folder um, it's fairly easy in Pixite to see which image you want to take so if we just look at one of those now there shouldn't be a vast difference from the uncalibrated images um, we are still going to have hot pixels because we haven't used a dark but we'll deal with them in the next process but you know it's now there is a few, my one shot color 460 does have some odd bias artifacts in the left hand side and towards the top and those appear to have been taken out Having calibrated our images, we do know because we haven't used a dark as part of the calibration, we do now need to rid the image of some of these hot pixels. So we'll do that with cosmetic correction script, cosmetic correction process. It's useful first to create a preview that includes your main subject and a selection of those hot pixels. If we now pick to that preview we can see them. If we now start under pre-processing cosmetic correction. Okay, we've got the last files. And if we then pick our calibrated images, open those. It's very important if you're using one shot colour to click on that CFA button. Uh, otherwise the image cosmetic correction script does all sorts of nasty things if it's a mono image untick that we get to have a real-time preview with this click on the real-time preview it doesn't look all that pretty but you can see that by using auto detect those hot pixels get dealt with very efficiently uh, I find that a hot sigma and a cold sigma are about three to be ideal. So if we turn that up, then some of these hot pixels start appearing back in. You can also see at the bottom how many pixels within that preview screen are being dealt with by the script, by the process. But if we leave that at three, get rid of the preview, we have the list, we're going to output them to the same directory and just run it. As it runs, once it's loaded a few images, you'll start getting an indication of how many hot pixels in each image the process is dealing with. I'll come up here in a moment. You can see around about 600, 500 Some images it's two and a half thousand, you can see the variation four thousand in that one. In many ways, not using a dark frame to deal with hot pixels and using this process I find gives much better results. So the script's finished up a little bit. If we now open one of those right to the bottom here we have they all have a CC suffix cosmetic correction. If we open one of those, carry out a stretch, you should see when we zoom in, remember this is still a bad image. There are one or two, but by and large it's probably done as good a job as dark subtraction in dealing with hot pixels. Carrying out calibration this way might seem a bit of a long-winded process but actually once you develop a workflow it is fairly quick to do 
and it does give you a lot of control at each stage. There is a script called the batch preprocessing script which will do all of these bits of the process together. I, it does work and it's fine. Um, I still prefer to do it one step at a time. The next step is now to debayer all of those images. And there's a, a script for doing that in a batch. So we add our files that have been cosmetically corrected, those CC files, to that. I know the bare pattern of my 460 is a GRBG. We'll evaluate noise and we'll then click on execute. This takes quite some time as it does devise each image separately. So I'll let that run and accelerate the process in the video, otherwise we'll be sitting here for about five minutes. The bear script is now finished. I will open one of those debayed frames and just make sure that it's done what we want it to do. And when we click on auto stretch, yuck. That's not to be unexpected. It is now a debayed image. Fortunately, we've got one hot pixel sat right there. It's a bit of a shame, we'll have to deal with that later on. If we unlink the channels, you get a better, better view of what the image will look like once it's been calibrated. These images were taken with a light pollution filter on and in a part of my sky where I've got some quite horrible gradients, quite, quite light polluted, but I do find even in perfect conditions, colour balance of a one-shot colour camera is quite tricky to deal with subsequently and actually mono images taken through RGB filters actually, at the end of the day is probably easier. We're going to get somewhere now in our pre-processing to, to get a stacked image. Next step to actually align all of our images together. This is carried out on debayed images. Don't try and align images still with a with a Bayer matrix embedded in them. It really doesn't work very well. So we're going to pick a as our reference. We're going to pick a frame. These are our debayed images. They actually have a prefix of debayer. They get sorted quite nicely in the folder. You can pick almost any image. And we then add all of them, including our reference frame, even though that will obviously have no realignment taking place. We're not going to do some options up here that deal with creating mosaics. We're just going to use the default settings on all of those default settings on star detection matching and interpolation um, you sometimes get some tricky images where you might need to play with the settings on those but for 90 percent of images the default star alignment settings seem to work very well and we're going to have a post fix on there of r and gain this takes a few moments so i'll set it running explain a few things that come up in the process console window and then accelerate the video until it comes to the end. The process console gives you a constant running commentary of what it's doing and, and of, of interest is what it's doing to each image in relation to the reference image in terms of its rotation and 
how far it's having to move the image horizontally and vertically. This will deal with images that have been taken either side of the meridian if you've carried out a meridian flip so the images are you know, some of the images are upside down this will deal with that you don't need to pre-rotate images prior to putting them in in this stack and it will deal with um, images with quite large movements between them if you are trying to combine images on taken with different cameras it is worth turning on this distortion correction element of star alignment and it will try and correct for distortion using a distortion model uh, it's particularly useful to use that if you are doing mosaics um, otherwise sometimes you get some distortion on the on the scene between images uh, that, that works very very well but it is very very slow it's a very processor intensive it's an iterative process and it, it can take an awful lot of time uh, to do 30 images like this it would probably take an hour hour and a half but it does correct very efficiently any form of distortion between images I've quite successfully combined images taken from different cameras on different scopes on different times and the distortion correction has brought everything into line we're actually nearly finished you can see as you get near to your reference image this movement between frames gets quite small I, I think the PixInsight star alignment routine works better than any other that I've come across. I'll just accelerate the last for the last five five images. So the stacking is now finished. Sorry, the star alignment is now finished. So we will have in our directory. We're getting quite quite busy but at the bottom we will have the bad registered images there those block of images at the bottom are now ready for stacking and now for the moment of truth the last step in the pre-processing is stack all of our images together we do this with a process called image integration they are our last ones. Now we're going to add our block of debayed, registered, cosmetically corrected, calibrated, and approved images. It doesn't matter too much which one you pick as a reference, um, it should be one of the ones with a better signal to noise ratio and if you hadn't sorted them out prior to integrating so we've only picked images with a reasonably high signal to noise ratio it would be a good idea to try and find one which you thought was pretty good and set that as a reference here we're going to do an average combination average the options are average or median really for, for combining light images average will always give you a better signal to noise ratio in the resultant stack other than that we're going to we're going to choose fairly by our default settings up here we've got a, a good number of images so we're going to use a sigma clipping means of pixel rejection I, I like the Windsor Eye sigma clipping I think it gives very good results and I like a sigma low of you know, so it'll clip low pixels that are more than four sigma from the average and the sigma high of three we haven't got any, st any so well, let's try it at three and a half and be fairly unrestrictive of what gets clipped off we haven't got any start any satellite trails in any of these images because we've already rejected those before we stacked them if you had satellite images you might have, have to be more restrictive and lower that down to two and a half to three but we, we, we actually want to get as much signal to noise ratio out of our 
resultant stack. We want to use as much of the image as we possibly can, so I'm going to be fairly permissive with my sigma high. We'll apply global. Again, this takes quite some time to do, so I'll accelerate the video and come back when it's finished. You, you will get a running commentary of the relative weights of each image as it's used in the stack in red, green, and blue channels. If you suddenly see one of these, which is much higher than the reference, it's worth st stopping it and re resetting your reference image to be that image. Um, you, you really want those to be at or around one. They should all be very, very close because we've picked images that are fairly well matched in terms of their signal to noise ratio. But if you're stacking a lot of images which are very variable, it's worth just trying to find the one in the stack that has the highest weight and use that there as the Image integration outputs three images. It gives you a picture of what's been rejected as being high. For satellite trails, you'd see those very obviously across this, but as I said earlier, I do find that they sometimes leave some very faint artifacts. So if you've got enough images to avoid using them in the stack, it's worth doing. It does the same pixels that's been rejected low. You can see the stacking errors. These images were taken over a period of five nights. So you do get some lack of lack of fit between them. And finally we get our stacked image. Even that these are quite low signal subs, I didn't really expect the resultant image to be totally noise free and it hasn't disappointed me what I am quite pleased with is that the hot pixel that I didn't get rid of in cosmetic correction was obviously an outlier in the stack one of those odd pixels that suddenly becomes bright so it doesn't it's not there in the result the stack so it's done quite a good job of getting rid of odd ones um, if I unlink the channels you can see that I've still got quite a lot of work to do in colour calibrating this but we'll do that next to start with. First thing I do is save that image. I've put quite a lot of work into getting to that stage so I want to make sure I save that. I'm going to save it as a 32-bit floating point image which is PixInsight standard. All of PixInsight imaging processing can be done in 32-bit can be even be done in 64-bit but there's not a lot of benefit in doing that unless you're doing some fairly complex stuff but 32-bit is a standard um, so we're just going to save that out and we can then carry on with processing the image and do the fun bit the first thing we need to do before we do anything else is deal with color calibration. This image is a long way short of being anywhere near calibrated and the RGB channels are significantly out of sync with each other. We'll, color calibration in PixInsight is a two-stage process and it can be quite fiddly. So we're going to generate a couple of previews use for the two stages of kind of calibration. We're going to pick one where we think it seems to have a fairly featureless background. The first step is color calibration, is background neutralization. We're going to use our integration preview one. And the background in this, the upper limit of background, I mean, the general background if you look at the bottom of the screen in this area here, you get a view of what's happening underneath the cursor. You can even 
click on the image and it will give you where we've got background RGB you can see that the red is significantly higher than the green and the blue but all of those values are below 0.1 we don't want to include any stars which are have got a higher background level so we are going to keep that as 0.01 and apply that to our image now if we redo our screen transfer function you'll see the background neutralization has actually done quite a good job of neutralizing the background but it's, if we link the channels it's left our galaxy very red so we're now going to try and deal with that with color calibration and we're going to use that, that preview preview 2 as our white reference and preview 1 uh, as our background reference now, we really want to avoid picking up any of the background in our white reference. We don't want any of these pixels here to be used as being white. We want to get right, right into the galaxy. So I'll put a lower limit on that of 0 0.002. And if you scroll around, that's about, and as we come into it, we go up above 0 0.002 and up and up and up. And the background, we're going to leave as 0 0.01. We could probably make that even lower, but it should work. And we'll output white reference masks and the background reference mask just so we can see that it's actually picked pixels that we want to use as a, as a reference. So if we apply that to our image, we should see that it's actually picked quite a lot of pixels in there. Probably need to be a bit more restrictive. But if we now apply that's actually done a that's link channels that's done a really really good job of giving us a white a white galaxy with with color in it we can pick the color back up later the background is now very well neutralized to almost black and our galaxy is is looking the values in that are all about the same so it's done a very good job if you haven't got a galaxy to use as a white reference, you have no option but to use the star field. This image would be very difficult because there's not a lot of stars in it, but if you were using a white reference, um, you'd probably pick preview one for the white reference and the background reference and just click on structure detection and it would pick all the stars in that preview and use them as average white. Uh, this probably works better than that. So we'll now just have a clean up before we go to the next stage and we'll delete all previews we don't need those any longer. It's worth pointing out at this stage that this is still a linear, linear image if we take the screen, screen stretch off you can see that it is still a linear image and we can only see it because we've applied a temporary stretch to it. Now quite often in images we would have horrible gradients to deal with. Very fortunate in this image that gradients aren't that great, but if we had gradients to deal with, the dynamic background extraction tool is very useful. Just click on the image, generate some samples, add a few manually to fill in the gaps. I like to add a few extra ones into the corners. around where I think I would like the background sampled and if you create image you'll see that there are some images but to be honest with you they are so minor that I don't think they're gonna worry us with this image I'm not even gonna bother applying that but if you if you felt you needed to just click on correction, subtract that and replace the image and it will subtract that background from the light. You can also use this dynamic back background extraction tool if you haven't taken flats to create a false flat. Um, 
in this in that instance you would divide you, you would end up with an image a background image that looked very much like a flat and you would divide that into the image but for gradients you subtract and I'm not gonna in this instance I'm not gonna use DBE on this image it really doesn't need it and prob would probably introduce more artifacts more color shading in the background and it's going to take away yes this image is a little bit darker in some of the corners but on the basis I'm going to crop this image at some point in time um, that really that really doesn't bother me that much so we've now done pretty much everything we want to do to this image in its linear state so it's time to go non-linear and the tool of choice for this is this transformation tool there are a number of other tools in PixInsight for doing this but I still prefer the good old stretch see that all of our data is fairly hard up against the left hand side of the histogram there is a real time preview function on this um, but to be honest with you I prefer to have a look at the histogram and judge the histogram rather than the real time preview but we'll leave it open for now never ever ever touch the white point there are pixels that are approaching white the minute you move that you will clip them to white and it's it's never a good idea we will just use this mid turn slider and it's pretty hard to see on on video but there is a line there and i try and get the peaks of my histogram somewhere near that line judge at this stage and we'll apply that to the image get rid of the real time preview reset that we've got quite a lot of headroom in the blanks we'll probably clip some by doing it <laughs> but it was a percentage term you're not clipping all that many pixels so we can do that and that to bring that back to that Sort of halfway between those first lines and apply that. There's an initial stretch. That's not too bad. The image isn't too bad either. Um, it's noisy in parts. And we'll deal with that in the next. Next up is noise reduction. Now, before I do noise reduction, I am going to carry out an initial crop of this image I don't want my noise correction tools to base anything on what's around so we're going to go into crop geometry crop dynamic crop I'm just going to crop a few pixels off the outside um, and put the middle of my galaxy right in the middle some people object to galaxies being off centre. Never bothered me, but there you go. Um, and I'm just applying a screen stretch to be able to see that better. Well, now we have several options in Pix Inside for noise reduction. ACDNR is quite an old tool, it does still work very well there are better ones it works quite well at having a lightness mask so it will only apply noise reduction to the high signal to noise ratio areas of the image that mask can be tweaked to give varying protection if I was running it on this image I'd probably do something around that, that as a mask there's quite a lot of signal in the middle quite a lot of noise in the outside that would probably work quite well as a mask and I would probably apply a mask to the, to the luminance the lightness values and use standard deviation of 1.5 as a value and the chrominance I probably wouldn't apply a mask I'd want some chrominance noise reduction on the galaxy itself so I'd probably leave the mask off I'm not going to use ACDNR on this image I'm going to use a new tool which is called TGV Denoise. 
This can be used on linear or non-linear images. Uh, I prefer to use it on linear images, on non-linear images. Um, if you're going to use it prior to stretching, and it does work quite well prior to stretching on mono images, if you want to carry out noise reduction on mono images before combining them into an RGB image or combine narrowband into a RGB image, it does work quite well on a, in a linear state. But I find it only works well if you've got very high signal to noise ratio in the in the base image. This this is a bit low in signal to noise. So I'm not going to you know, I've chosen to do this in a non-linear state. If you can do it on linear state, all of these need reducing by a factor of ten and logarithmic, so that is a factor of ten on that slider. <coughs> but for non-linear image the default settings seem to work very well. I actually like to drop the strength a little tiny bit and I will drop the edge protection even a smaller amount on this. The default iterations is 100. It's nowhere near enough for this process. It really needs to go up to the, into the 500 range. It's an iterative noise reduction process so it will go through 500 iterations of noise reduction. But you can also click on this automatic convergence which says when the changes between subsequent iterations has dropped to a certain value it will automatically stop. I'm not going to use local support on this image. I find local support quite hard to get right. So it's okay on non-linear images, but the minute sorry, on linear images, but the minute you go non-linear, and with RGB, I find getting a local support image, um, which is, isn't a mask, but it works kind of like a mask. I find that quite hard and quite it's quite sensitive to that mask. So I'm not going to use that that at all. So we'll now apply that to our image. This takes an awful long time to run. Um, it carries carries out noise reduction on, on each channel. And you can see it ticks through that. So I will accelerate the video and come back when it's finished. It actually converged a lot quicker than I thought it was going to. Um, but if you now look into the image, screen stretch go undo it's never going to be perfect on an image like this but unstretched without a screen stretch in fact we're going to get rid of that altogether now it's done a pretty good job of getting rid of that very visible noise but without creating the sort of milky cartoony type effect you can get with some noise reduction um, it has left some noise behind but given the, the noise in the subs of this image it's probably not a bad result at all next process I'm going to apply to this image is wavelets now some people love wavelets some people hate them um, on an image like this I do think they bring out some of the faint detail in the middle of the galaxies and do a little bit of pseudo sharpening as well. So I am going to apply wavelets. It's under multiscale processing, HDA multiscale transform. I'm not going to go overboard. You, know, you can go right down in wavelet layers and, and create detail that doesn't really exist. And I'm going to apply it to seven. Um, I am going to apply a lightness mask and I've got some fairly blobby stars in this uh, which aren't of perfect shape uh, so I'm, I want to protect those and de-ring that make sure they don't ring so I'm going to try wavelet layers for 7 undo redo it's zoomed in it's probably more obvious than it is zoomed out but I think seven is probably a good compromise for that let's try let's just try eight it's certainly brightened it but I don't see that it's 
from most of the data. So we'll, just to give you a clue as to how daft it can get, if you apply 4, it's starting to try and create a detail that doesn't really exist. It's not so obvious on this one, but on some galaxies it can go quite mad. So I'm, I'm going to leave it at 7. It's a fairly subtle application of wavelets in this instance. It's beginning to look quite nice. And the next thing I'm going to do is create a mask, a luminance mask. Just drag the image tab onto the desktop, let go, and then drag it back to the left hand side of the image. And it's created a mask very, very easily. Don't really want that showing, so we'll just show mask but just that tab there is now orange to show that it has got a mask applied and I'm going to apply some local histogram equalization I find that this can work quite well after applying wavelets just to restore some contrast uh, real-time preview it's just somewhere around about the 160 mark This definitely is best off applied to a mask, otherwise it can, it can really highlight any residual noise in the background. So I always recommend applying this with a mask, and you'll see that that's, again the effect is quite subtle. Undo, redo, undo, redo. It just creates, it just replaces some of the contrast lost by applying wavelets and that's now actually beginning to look a lot better. Uh, when we have a luminous mask applied, remember we've got this mask applied so everything in red is going to be largely untouched by any process we apply. We'll give us a bit of a saturation boost to boost some of those colours back up. So intensity transformations curves transformation. Now, you can use curves for levels very successfully. I prefer the histogram tool. One thing that this is very good for is boosting saturation. If you click on the S, it just, it will just, the curve applies purely to the saturation. Click on the real time preview and give that a fairly hefty boost. starting to bring out some of that detail in there a little bit better. I'm actually going to reset that and apply a further gentle boost. It's really brought out the dust lanes and started to bring out some of the detail on that side. stars are looking a bit anemic so the next part of the process is going to involve creating a mask for our stars I find that the star mask process at pretty well its default settings creates a mask plenty good enough for what we want to do now of just the stars will pick up bits of noise as well and this has picked up bits of noise that aren't really stars but it should for our purposes you have the noise threshold if you want to be a bit more selective mask mask show mask and you'll see that actually the only things that are white are our stars so we'll now do the same again same curves transformation. Let's have a real time preview to make sure we aren't making the stars to red. And in this case, you can give it a fairly hefty 
left. This is largely to taste. I like the stars to have some colour, and those are looking as though they're going to have. It's going to replace the colour that's lost, and it's done quite a nice job of putting some colour back into the, st into the stars. Undo, redo, and well, we've got that mask applied. There's not many stars in this star field. Um, some images are full of stars, and I like to finish it off. with a morphological transformation just to reduce the stars. I've got a three-way model which I created literally by drawing in this grid. Um, it, the bottom layer is quite big, the middle layer is a bit smaller, the top layer is smaller still. And that's the model used for, for the stars. Erosion minimum and I drop this right down to about 0.15 and give it three iterations. You should see the stars visibly reducing star size and brightness on images with a lot of stars in them. That can really make the stars disappear into the into the background and make your object stand out a lot better than if you didn't undo redo it's subtle but I think it's part of a nice part of the cleaning up process so we now have a reasonably nice image of M51 given the state of the original subs which had quite low noise quite, quite low signal quite high noise I think that's done quite a nice job we'll finish it off with a final Curves transformation, this time in RGB, and it's a very, very subtle S curve, which you can do by eye, just to darken the background and hide that noise a little bit further. I don't like dark backgrounds particularly, but in this instance, there's not much you can do but, you know, to get rid of the, of the noise in the image. Probably lose a lot of detail, so in this instance you just go a bit darker than you would normally and the last thing I always do there's not a lot of green in this image but you hit it with a neutral green green shouldn't be there in a, in a RGB image so I just hit it with SCD and R, SC and R average neutral on green and it removes any green tinge to it. There wasn't a lot there, but it's, it's made the greens tendencies for those little areas there to be a little bit grainy. It's neutralised them. And that's it. Thanks for watching.